you know what? I've had enough of drawing designs and pretty pictures. Let's build something that actually looks like a combat robot. Welcome back everyone. I'm Jason, the creator of Team Rock Robotics, and it's time to get back working on our Antweight Combat Robots. Now in part three of this series, we're gonna pick up more or less where we left off in part two, because that makes chronological sense. <laughs> And we're moving on to what I'm calling rapid prototyping the structure of the robot. So in part one, we did a fancy picture. Part two, we did something that's more or less a 3D design or depending on your approach, maybe a 2D architectural design, whatever it may be. And now we want to start turning that idea and that design into a real 3D object like this right here. Ignore the wires hanging off. <laughs> it happened. Now, if you have access to even a basic 3D printer during this step, you're going to be in a lot better shape than someone who does not. Even if the final robot is not going to be 3D printed, or you're going to be having someone with a better printer do the 3D printing. Because what we're going to be doing here is taking our design, 3D printing it out, trying things out, see what works, what doesn't work, go back, make some modifications, 3D print something out, and you're going to see how this goes. So instead of having to say do a whole bunch of machining, whether by hand or by some sort of CNC tool, having a 3D printer to approximate your final robot, like I said, even if there's going to be some other material in the end, will make this process of prototyping a lot easier. Now there are four goals we're trying to accomplish during this rapid prototyping of the structure, and the first one is making sure everything actually fits. Now I think I mentioned this briefly in one of the previous two episodes, but when it comes to these robots, you don't have as much space inside of them as you might initially think, especially because wiring takes up a lot more space than you think it might. It seems like it'd be small, flexible, really thin, but it gets curled up and messy really fast. So by 3D printing your first design and actually putting your components in here to see if they fit is a very important first step with the prototyping process. Because also, sometimes your final components are a little bit different in size for one reason or another than what you measured. Um, batteries in particular with the little wires sticking off them. Sometimes you don't factor that into your design. Other little things like that. Um, fortunately for my robot, I got it pretty close to where I want in terms of having things fit in here. Um, these two little connector pieces that are kind of floating around, those are not going to be in the final robot. They're for prototyping the electronics, so I'm not worried about those. So now that I've got all the things in the robot and they fit decently well, let's drive this guy around. Because, you know, just like with our, what I call it, functional sketch, this thing is a fully functional robot. So that drive test went pretty well. So let's talk about the second thing that we're trying to resolve here with prototyping the structure. And it's a very broad category, but we're looking for any kind of issues we see with our design and we're changing them now. So let's take a look at some of the issues I had with this 3D printed version of the robot and we'll see about how to fix those. First of all, it pertains to the armor mount. So I've got a number of these things around here. You can see there's ones there, one in the back. Those are going to be the post mounts, I guess we'll call them, for the UHMW armor that's going to go around the robot. It'd be the main armor body, or body body armor, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, the problem is, though, a lot of them don't stick out far enough. But if I put my finger there as if it's a UHMW armor, there's not a lot of space and in some cases, like with the front mounts, there's no space. <laughs> so basically the armor will be rubbing up against the wheels or the drivetrain or something like that. Number two here pertains to the weapon mounting system. Now, right now this little bolt I've got here is my stand-in for the shaft. Doesn't quite work because it's not secured in both ends. But what you'll notice is the weapon blades come awfully close to that little piece of the chassis I have right there. And frankly, these are gonna be UHMW and UHMW can flex a little bit. And if these flex a little bit and hit their own chassis, well, that's a bad thing, of course. Third thing, let's talk about the fact it's held together with rubber bands. There's one little bolt right here, but that's not doing what you think it might be doing. So let me open this guy up. What I should have done early on was actually test fit some pieces. Now, I have these six posts in here in the robot, and the idea was that the top lid would screw into those posts such that each post would have a little hex insert. I've actually got it 
attach the lid up here, this little brass hex insert would be in each one of those posts and then a screw would screw into it, which is all fine and dandy and I'll probably still do that approach. However, I didn't test to make sure that the hex that I modeled in Blender actually fit the hex piece. I should have 3D printed one of these posts by themselves and then over time or a few iterations tested out to make sure that the hex insert fit in there. So because of that, that whole system didn't work in this prototype and it was held together with rubber bands. <laughs> now the other thing that I intentionally designed into the robot that I didn't end up liking was the motor mounts. So in this case, the chassis has the bottom half of the motor mounts and the lid has the top half of the motor mounts and therefore when the robot's closed up, it holds everything together and that actually works. The problem is that means the motors are kind of flopping around a little bit when you have the lid off and you're working on the robot, which is just annoying and it kind of gives you one more thing you got to worry about when you're hurrying up for a battle. Did you make sure the motors are in the exact position they should be when you close the lid up? Because if they weren't, yeah, weird things could happen. So I'm going to modify the motor mounts such that they're always permanently basically holding the motors down. Right now i got some zip ties that sort of work. The last thing that's an issue is up here where the bolts are for the UHMW. Um, the problem is I designed this to be held together by two small little braces. You can see a 3D printed version right here. And that bolt position, there's a little hole in there you can see, that is so low to the bottom of the brace here that you can't actually attach a nut to it because there's not enough room. So what I'm going to end up doing, instead of having two small braces, one in the bottom and one in the top that's not pictured up here in, in this model, I'm going to make this bottom one just have the sides come up and bolt into the top hole. So there's only going to be one bolt on either side holding the frame together, but there's actually going to be a bolt there, which is more important than two bolts that can't possibly fit because there's not enough room. Let's get the parts from this chassis into the new one and see how things work from there. Apparently the motor mount uses imperial screws. Like, what the, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I'm going to bed. Screw this. Ugh. So here's the chassis that I just removed all the components from. And one thing I was thinking about, and by that I mean I read it in a Facebook group, it occurred to me that the weapon cage up here, it's only held down to the chassis bottom by these six screws. Therefore, any impacts up here, in particular vertical impacts, would put a lot of stress purely on the relatively thin base of the chassis, which increases the chance of some sort of catastrophic failure. Now, what I did over here with the new chassis, let's see if I can hold it up right. See, there's a bolt here, and there's going to be one over here underneath this red tape that helps hold the weapon motor in. But that goes through the weapon cage and into the side supports here for attaching the armor. So there I've got a different type of connection to the chassis for holding the weapon cage in there and therefore a little bit better distribution of some of the forces that are going to be brought on by the weapon impacts or other things like that. The third goal is all about figuring out just how maintainable your chassis is. How long does it take for you to replace components, tape things apart, those kind of things. As a side effect of this prototyping process, you're going to be taking apart and reassembling your robot quite a bit. And I'm already starting to realize very quickly what is the right way to assemble this robot. Now this is important because in competition, you could be looking at as little as 20 minutes between matches. So you've got to be able to turn this thing around really fast. At the very least, you've got to be able to get a new battery in this thing really fast. So if it takes you 10 minutes to get your battery out, 
and then another 10 minutes to put one in, that's a very bad thing. So thinking about those kind of things while you're going through this process and how you can redesign aspects to make it faster, but also, like I said, figuring out what the right way is to assemble your robot. Now, in particular for me, what I'm probably going to end up doing is so I have this weapon cage here. The entire weapon cage is going to be assembled itself outside of the robot. I'm going to attach the weapon motor into it, and then I'm going to stick that in in one piece, attach it to the chassis, and then I will be able to install the receiver. So that's an odd bit of combination of things there, but that's going to allow me to basically easily reassemble the weapon area of the robot instead of kind of fiddling around with it as I did trying to put it all together now. So objective four is figuring out if your estimates for the weight of your chassis are correct. This part's really important if you're actually having a 3D printed chassis. Obviously, we've seen before in the design step, CAD programs or a blender, whatever it can be, is pretty good at calculating the total volume of a 3D object. However, when it comes to 3D printed things, they're not necessarily a solid object. You're gonna have your different number of walls, infill, all that stuff. And those parameters are kind of unique to whatever print settings you use for your slicer program. And therefore, your particular CAD program maybe or cannot at all generate an accurate weight estimate of your chassis. Now, at the end result, I'm going to be going with some sort of nylon. And I know the density of that nylon. I also know the density of the PLA that I'm working with. So therefore, I can print a new chassis up with print settings that are going to be very close to the final nylon version and therefore I'll be able to get an accurate weight of this chassis in PLA and then I can do the quick density math to figure out what its final weight is going to be in whatever nylon variant I'm going to be choosing. And well, five and a half hours later we've got ourselves a PLA analog for our final chassis. Along with a yeah, close enough lid I've got right here. Let's put these guys on a scale. Actually, I've already put them on a scale, to be honest with you. I don't feel like shooting the B-roll. And they came out to 91 grams. So how does that correspond to you know, using nylon? Well, we can figure that out with some basic math. So over here, we have the densities of PLA and the density of nylon. And we know that the mass of our chassis is equal to the density times its volume. But the volume is kind of the unknown thing because of all the infill and the walls and all those things. So we can solve for volume, which is simply mass divided by density. And we do know that between the nylon chassis and the PLA chassis, the volume, of course, is the same. So we know that the mass of PLA divided by its density is equal to the mass of the nylon divided by its density. So given that the chassis at PLA is 91 grams, divide that by 1.24. That's equal to the mass of the nylon divided by its density of 1.14. Doing some quick math there, we know the mass of the nylon chassis is going to be about 83.6 to 84 grams. So let's take a look at my spreadsheet with all the estimates of the mass of my robot. And under nylon chassis, I was shooting for 83 grams. Now if we look a few rows down, I've got a second entry for the nylon top at 22 grams. So in reality, my entire chassis is going to be over 100 grams in mass. As I'm currently calculating it based on these actual PLA prints, I've got 84 grams from both halves. So I'm doing pretty good. I'm going to update these numbers and I'll move along from there. And that pretty much brings us to the end of this video. So once again, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. And the process from here is pretty much just going back over your design, making revisions to try to accomplish those four goals that we've talked about so far in this video. And you'll get to a point kind of like this, where you've got something that's pretty close to being battle ready. And then you realize you have not taken your power switch out of its package and it doesn't have a spot in the chassis. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. Have a great week.